Welcome back to the Ignite Podcast. I'm your host, Brian. Today, I have Jeff Martin, a CEO and founder of Collective Genius, also author of Peak Teams, Mastering the Habits of Unstoppable Ventures, uh, venture-backed companies, I should say, which we're really excited to talk about. Jeff, welcome to the show. We'd love to get an intro for the audience. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. yeah. My name is Jeff Martin. I'm based in Los Angeles. Uh, I founded, sold, played a variety of roles in venture-backed companies early in my career. Uh, then I founded Collective Genius all the way back in 2004. I'm almost on 20 years. Mm. So Collective Genius, we build high-performing teams for venture-backed companies and venture capital firms. Um, over the last 20 years, we worked with hundreds of CEOs, founders, and investors. Um, and what we really do is build unstoppable teams, which we're probably going to talk about in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's Collective Genius. That's amazing. How did, so how did you get into that? Were you just in startups and you, you realized that teams are a big problem for scaling startups? Yeah. Tell us the genesis. Early, yeah. yeah. So I uh, went to school for entrepreneurship uh, and finance, grew up in a super entrepreneurial family. And I was always really nerdy about business. Like I, from the, my very beginning, I just was fascinated with business and my, my family businesses and relatives and just really nerdy about business. So when I went to school and I wasn't sure I knew it was going to be business and I found entrepreneurship as a major uh, back in the late 90s, which was really mm. unheard of back then. I went to yeah, very rare. University yeah. and um, I was like, I found my home and I found my people. So um, I had started a few businesses in college. Uh, I ended up growing one significant one. I would call it the real one. Uh, in college, and I was studying entrepreneurship. So I really felt like I was learning all the tools and everything that I needed to really build this business, which it allowed me to do. Um, on graduation, I really wanted to get into something bigger and learn from other people. So I sold the business. And it was the dot com boom. Oh, wow. So 98, uh, you know, it was booming. And I thought, man, who's going to hire someone that started a business and has an entrepreneurship degree? Like, who's going to want someone like that? Right? Yeah. Um, but I found all these dot coms are like very interested in having someone oh, that's that interesting. Had, yeah. had that kind of one, probably the mindset I, in hindsight, looking back and also um, just willing to do anything and try anything to make things work. And um, when the first one I went to was a company called techies.com and it was probably the first online marketplace for tech professionals. So we'd call them probably like online job boards now or you know, uh, Monster or, you know, all the different job boards that you see that were out there. This one was tech focused. My first day on this job, I was just like completely blown away at how different this company was based on everything I learned in college and everything I learned in building my company um, prior or when I was in college. And it was like, you know, my appetite for entrepreneurship and, and business was huge. And I felt like I was drinking from the fire hose. Mm at this company. And it's right then and there, I realized venture back companies are just very different. They're very different. Yeah. And uh, the, the talent that you need, the systems that you need, the mentality that you need is very, very different. And um, as I worked in a bunch of these companies and got good at a variety of roles, like I've played probably every role that you can think of from mm. biz dev, sales, product, chief of staff. Um, as I learned these roles and, and were in a bunch of these companies, um, I just wanted to kind of give back and find a way to make more of those companies successful. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, venture back companies, not only are they unique in their makeup, but they're also unique in what they're, they're doing in the world. They're really, I believe, moving humanity forward. And I was yeah. trying to find a really good way to, uh, a way that I could do something unique in that space to help people. Yeah. And, and, and that difference might be taken for granted uh, between you and I, right? Because, you know, we, we're, we both swim in this swim lane. But for maybe right. some audience members out there that are completely new to startups, uh, which I'm sure there are a few. Sure. Uh, why don't you unpack a little bit, like, what makes venture back startups uh, interesting or, or different from kind of your standard, I don't know, restaurant mm -hmm. business or, I don't know, right. wholesale right. pool supply business or something like that? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I think, I think the first thing is, is, Venture back companies are typically only going to get venture capital if they're doing something that's never been done before, mm. right? So no one's going to invest in a company uh, that's uh, in the VC space where you're expecting high returns and high risk. No one's going to invest uh, those type of, that type of capital in like a plumbing company or a dental right. office, right? Yeah. So they're only going to invest these the highest risk investments in companies that are doing something very new, maybe using new technology. Um, I always like to say doing things that have never been done before, yeah. making new in a highly places. scalable way. Yeah. 
Yeah, and they're seeking, hopefully, that they can scale this, you know, maybe uh, beat the beat out like whatever the incumbent technology is, if it was landline telephones, and now we're using mobile phones or whatever, right? Um, so the dynamic of that is very different. Um, we're building something, we might fail versus uh, taking a job that, you know, the company has been around a couple hundred years, and you know, you're going to float around this company and hope work, work your way up. So the mentality is we're going into these companies, we're doing something that's never been done before. And uh, the behavior of the ones that are successful are very different mm. than the ones that are not successful. And the behavior in these companies is very different than a lot of other large companies. So, you know, you're, you really need to really dial in becoming a team and really going after something that's very difficult. So uh, it's very, very different. These companies also have boards. Some yeah. businesses don't have boards. They right. have investors that, that have demands. So there's a lot of other stakeholders involved in these companies um, that make them unique and different. Just unpack a little bit the um, the team component. Uh, you know, let's talk about like maybe a seed funded startup and kind of what they're getting right and wrong at that stage versus maybe a, like a more growth stage. Let's start with the seed and kind of, you know, maybe some of those first hires and talk about some of the strategies that you recommend and things that get wrong yeah. and stuff like that. So seed stage is typically the earliest investment stage of, of these venture back companies. Uh, someone will come in and want to provide some some sort of uh, capital to help the company go. And typically at this stage, uh, it might be a CEO, a founder, a couple founders, maybe a few people on their team. Um, but it's giving them money to actually kind of grow this idea and really test the idea. And so sometimes people have a product in market. Some people mm -hmm. don't have a product in market. Sometimes they just have an I'd assumption. Say nowadays, seed, you pretty much have a product in market. Maybe pre-seed, you don't because um, there's been a delineation now. It used to be also like anything after the angel round or friends and family round was seed. And now we have this new kind of breed called the pre-seed. Right. Uh, I totally agree. A, yeah. Anyway. I was definitely lumping those together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I do too. Right? I'm guilty of that. But... <laughs> So there's there's kind of a range of you know uh, timeline. Typically at that stage, uh, they they receive some money from investors, and now they really need to grow the team. They really need to bring this product to market. They want to really make sure that they uh, they have product market fit, meaning that they understand their market. They built a product that people want, love, hopefully they can't live without. Uh, and their job is to really bring the right people on and scale that product and bring that product to life. Um, at the same time, hopefully show some some metrics towards adoption, um, uh, growth and in, in revenue. Um, and so that's, that's the stage team dynamics, team dynamics at the very early stage and even mid and late stage companies, I think for venture back companies really revolve around the same things. Um, so I think the behavior is the same. I think, you know, it's all about constant learning. You know, it's a team that's in there that's constantly hungry to learn and figure out ways that they can do things um, to be successful. I think it's about uh, these teams, very similar to sports teams, right? They, they have to figure out what's the, what's the objective, what's the goal, you know? Like if it's hockey, you want to put the puck in the net, right? But with <laughs> these companies, they really need to find, define themselves what they need to accomplish and what they need to do so they can all play their respective parts. It reminds and me I of Sam Altman's uh, definition of this. What's the, the definition of a startup is, I, I'm paraphrasing, but... sure. A, a team that finds a repeatable, scalable business. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I like that. It's a repeatable, scalable business. And scalable right. meaning like, I'm, I'm not going to open the second donut shop. Uh, scalable in the way like the, the nth customer basically is, is free to, um, to onboard. Right. Yeah. And I think that's where that learning piece comes in is that repeatable piece, yeah. right? you can make some assumptions what might be repeatable. Um, and I like to use this analogy of, of climbing uh, a peak, right? So if you envision um, where are we going to be at the end of the year and at the top of this, this peak that we have um, is really defining what that is and getting the team to align around what that is. Now, as you make your journey, you're going to come across things that you didn't expect because you're doing something no one's ever done yeah. before, right? You yeah. don't have the blueprint for this. And so finding that repeatability and finding the things that what I like to say work <laughs> um, so you can repeat those is a little bit of a, a mystery and a journey. Yeah. So walk us through kind of the phases of working. I mean, you're obviously going in, you're parachuting into these startups and working with them for weeks, if not months, and um, kind of walk us through the phases of that journey. How give us a commercial for, you know, there's yeah. a founder out there listening right now, probably uh, right, to right. this podcast, and he's interested in how you help 
create better culture in teams. So yeah. what, would, what would you tell that founder about how you work and, and kind of the, the stages of, of that work? Sure. Yeah, I have, I mean, usually I, I come in via one of our VC partners. So we have, you know, 75 plus venture capital firms that we support their portfolio companies when they have this need. Um, so usually it's through introduction or someone finds out about us, reaches out. Um, I come in at from seed series A, B, C, D, and later stage. I've, I've also worked with some public technology companies mm -hmm. that want to use the system as well. Um, but typically what they're looking for is to get their team organized. And uh, I think one of the biggest myths is that startups are chaos. And what I found in the last 20 years, the companies that are uh, the best startups are not chaos. Mm. They're, they're definitely organized. And there, there's always going to be this level of energy in the company yeah. and learning and things going on. But A little creative well, energy. Yeah, absolutely. But the companies that are the best uh, successful teams are very organized. And so what I'm brought in to do and what that looks like is there's you know, a handful of behaviors that I've found over the last 20 years that are really prevalent and needed in venture back teams. And how I get them to maximize those behaviors is to teach them a handful of tools and, um, you know, tools that help them align the team so they can agree on where they're going. They can agree on what they need to do, how they're going to do it, and then a systematic approach to keep them on track. Um, what an engagement might look like is typically a couple calls with the CEO founder learning about their team, um, understanding what's working, what's not working, um, and then introduction to the team, usually you do like a, a Zoom call and I introduce the tools and the behaviors, um, and then I come in and do a session. So the sessions are usually leveraging those tools. Um, it can either be a one or two or a three-day session with the team um, annually, quarterly. I have some teams that have been uh, having me come in every quarter for the last four and a half years. Um, I have other teams that will do it for a year or two. Um, but it, yeah, it's uh, I come in and help them align to what they're going to do, help them get focused on what that is, help them agree on what that all is, yeah. and then help them execute. Where do you see alignment usually falling uh, off a cliff with with teams that that you you look at for these startups? Like, where, sure. where are some common pitfalls or, or, or traps that these teams fall into? Yeah, I'd say number one, everybody knows that they need to focus, right? Everybody knows they need to focus. Um, getting to focus first takes alignment, meaning we have to agree on a handful of things before we can actually focus on what are the right things. And it typically goes off the cliff when teams don't want to sit still for a day or maybe mm. two days and actually really think through some of that. And so what I find using the analogy of like, climbing the mountain is that Oftentimes, teams are going in five different directions and they don't even realize it because they haven't had the right conversations. Mm. And so by having the right conversations, you can really define where you're going to go and what you need to do. Um, and if you haven't defined that, you're absolutely wasting time, you're wasting capital. Yeah. Um, and even worse, your team's energy, because the people on your team are only going to like take this journey as long as they have the energy to do it. If they lose the energy to do it, they're going to look for a better opportunity. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So when you when you think about um, scaling up the teams, uh, and I've asked this question to a, a few other folks, a sales consultant, a recruiter, do you uh, do you like to put the the higher top down? Like if you're if you're starting to build out your sales team, should you hire head mm -hmm. of sales first, and then that's your AE, and then your SDR, or should you do it the opposite and yeah. then hire the manager last? Yeah, and why right. why not? Yeah. So again, I, it comes from one of the tools that we use is three year vision. Where are we going to be three years out and getting the team mm -hmm. to agree and ally on that? Now, a lot of teams are very early stage and they're like, man, I don't know what's going to go on tomorrow. How are we going to know what's going to go on for you know, three years out? Right. It's a simple, short exercise, but it is to help the team get alignment to three peaks out, right? Once we understand that, then we can draw it back to this year and say, okay, now that we know generally where we're going, it's kind of far away and it's cloudy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now let's bring that back and what success look like by the end of the year. Once we define that and we bring it down to 90 days, when we know what success looks like in 90 days, that gives us a roadmap. So having that roadmap is really important before you do any hiring. Yeah. Right. So knowing that we're going to be maybe a $50 million company three years out, and we're going to be a $10 million company by the end of the year, and we're hiring sales. And right now we have maybe a founder led salesperson. Who do we need to actually what types of uh, talent and experience do we need in our sales team in order to get us to that $10 million this year? 
and looking a little bit into the future to bring us to that 50 million. So then you'd probably think, all right, well, as a head of sales, we would probably want to think about who's taken a business from 5 million to 50 million in three years, uh, who's worked in this marketplace, who has the network and experience and contacts to dig in right away, who sold SaaS before, whatever those dynamics yeah. are, is you what we refer to, and it's one of the tools that we have. Uh, in our system, peak team system, and in Rucksack, our tools online, is market mapping, uh, talent mapping, right? So you, mm. once you understand what you're going to do, where you're going to go, how to do it, now you can look at resourcing the people. And you might have some people on your team. So then you, once you know what that is, then you start to look who fits in what area. Mm. Can we scale that person up to fit that role? Um, you know, or they're not a fit. Maybe they don't even want that role, right? Right. Um, so then we're going to have to bring someone in. So. Not until you know what your map is, can you really, in an intelligent way, hire someone. Yeah. yeah, so you're beginning with the end in mind. You're kind of looking at, like, here's where we're going to be in three years. Right. Here's the knowledge, skills, abilities, and talent we need to have in place to, to achieve that, uh, that vision. And then you're working backwards and saying, like, who do we need to either scale up or hire right. uh, to make that reality? And you're also doing some executive uh, search uh, for these companies as well? Yeah, so I have a division um, within Collective Genius that's called Health Tech Search. And Health Tech Search is very specific to health tech companies mm. and go-to-market roles. So it's led by a, a partner of mine, Jeff Gersovich. He runs the search side of the business. Um, and we really narrowed that down to really you know, pinpoint go-to-market in, in the healthcare space. And so I have a background. Uh, we've been a search. We've done search as part of the business for many yeah. years. So, yeah. But that was curious. one of the biggest yeah. problems that we had is that, you know, you'd come into a company and you do a scorecard, which means gather the requirements of the role, understand the company, where it's going, all those things. And oftentimes the team didn't have alignment on that. So you'd mm. be hiring this head of sales and the CEO might have one idea of what that looks like. The CMO might have a different idea of what that looks like, but you need to, we needed to have alignment on that before we could actually start going to market and identifying people. Because once they start interviewing, and the team doesn't really even agree on what this person should be. It can be a bit of a mess yeah. when you're recruiting. Yeah. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention AI. I mean, everybody's talking about that. I've worked in it for a long time and sure. starting to think through kind of how it affects organizations. I mean, and you're probably starting to kind of see a little bit of it as well. How do you think uh, in the present day it's impacting kind of this team building and scaling? And how do you think it might uh, be impacting in the you know, I mean, all the three to five years? And how are you seeing this uh, play out as you start um, do, doing these three-year kind of planning exercises? Right, right. I think AI and the tools that we're building are going to be very helpful for that is to really get clarity on where you're going, what you need to do, how you need to do it, and then market map, talent map to the talent that you need. And I think it's also going to be helpful to uh, look at people's experience and break it down in a, a much more logical way to you know, if they had the experience to do this, they have the capabilities to do that, do that as well. And I think, yeah. I think AI is going to bring a lot of um, new tools that can help, help really define what that is. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of um, apps come out on the market using AI to do training. You know, uh, when I was at Microsoft, we, as a, ma a manager at Microsoft, we had to do like 150 hours of training a year. It was crazy, like three hours a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it was a lot of like, you know, uh, watching videos and right. then answering like uh, a quiz every five minutes to make sure you're like actually watching the videos. Um, <laughs> so I'm starting to see a lot of these SaaS apps come out that are using generative AI to do training. Right. Um, how do you think that's going to impact sort of, you know, people development and skill development? Um, do you feel like in the future, we're all just role playing with AIs as, as salespeople and, and, and getting better that way? Or do you feel like there's no kind of replacement for that human touch of like actually going and talking to customers and tripping over yourself? I think it's too early to tell. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not an AI expert. That's, that's for sure at this moment. <laughs> um, but I think it might be a little too early to tell. I think there's going to be some great optimizations for uh, assessments to understand what you actually need, to, what you currently know, yeah. and then also define what that gap is and to upscale some people in the areas that they, they need to know. Um, I think it will also help a lot to really understand people's motivations uh, behind what they want to do and where they want to go. Cause oftentimes there's a lot of people in roles that just don't really enjoy the work that they're doing, but they got yeah. that role. Yeah. And I think it's really important. One of the things that we do, um, when we have, you know, the map put together and we're looking at talents and the teams are assembling their the talent, 
they're really um, mindful of, is this person the right fit, have the right experience, but do they want the role, right? Yeah. And do they, do they fit our core values or core behaviors in our organization as well? And if, those, if one of the two, either of those are not a fit, that's not right. the person's not a fit. Yeah. What do you think is most important? Do you feel like, um, so you got like things like culture fit, you got things mm-hmm. like motivation. I think of the SL2 framework, right? Like how skilled are you versus how like motivated are you? Right. Um, versus just like, are you a good person? Are you, are, you, are you trying hard? Like, where would you rank all those things? Well, I think, I think they all matter. And yeah. I think you have to look at all of those, right? I, I think if, you know, especially when you look at the candidate mix, um, you're going you're gonna to be weighing that against the other candidates that you get into the system, right? Yeah. Um, into the funnel let's say um i think culture fit's really important if you're not going to fit the culture you're not going to be a good fit (laughs) do you have some examples of that like uh where you saw some teams have a a mismatch of cultures or or vice versa wow this team had a lot of cultural gelling like they really gelled as a culture um do you have some kind of yeah i I, know i the behaviors i talk about in my book peak teams really solidify and get clarity around what are the behaviors of high-performing teams and those behaviors are very similar to behaviors you see in any high performing team from sports teams to, you know, whatever team that you might see um, yeah. very specific though, to venture back teams. You know, I, I think, and what you're talking about gelling together is what I refer to symbiosis, mm. um, where the team's really working well together. Um, you know, could I have said, use the word synergy there? I, I think it kind of loses that human touch that symbiosis has. And I think symbiosis is really important. And if you think about venture back teams, they're very cross-functional, right? So what right. marketing yeah. is doing is really affecting sales. What engineering is doing or products doing is affecting. Yeah. And so one of the things. And There's a lot of, tools, of gray between the functional roles and a, and a fast growing kind of seed to call it series B startup. And I've been there like as, as a startup working professional. That was in marketing, but I'm kind of doing product or I was in product, but I'm kind of doing product marketing. And there's just always like this gray area. Well, let me tell you this. It's not always that way. (laughs) (laughs) So we get rid of the gray area. Very clear. All right. Yeah. So one of the tools and we've been kind of talking about this is that three year vision, that one year plan. We define roles and responsibilities within organizations every year, at least minimally at the leadership team level to really define who owns what. And to talk about those gray areas, because mm. those gray areas really is what's sucking capital and time and energy out of the company and trying to really get clarity around those areas. Yeah. Because they're so cross-functional, right? And so also using what we teach and train teams how to use OKRs and KPIs, the OKRs really allow you to see who's doing what, who owns what, um, who's bringing what across the finish line. And a lot of, a lot of those initiatives at the objective level, um, and in the key result level are cross-functional. So you might have an objective where uh, it's a sales thing that we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. But you look at the key results and we have products in there, marketing's in there, finances in there, and they're all driving things together to, to make that um, objective come to life. And that's that cross-functional nature of it. And that's, I think for us, when we teach OKRs and in, in the format that we teach OKRs is to allow that clarity, who's doing what, who owns what. And then that constant, look every single week where are we at what are our issues or problems or opportunities in dealing with those yeah so one of the key themes in the book is leadership excellence you know the this 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 visionary uh, examining how leaders foster culture of innovation resilience adaptability kind of talk us through some of the the key habits i guess of successful teams and leaders in, the, in those cases yeah um so i think leadership's an interesting word but my my belief on leadership is when I'm working with a leadership team, everybody needs to be a leader, right? Mm. And a lot of times I see someone on that leadership team, there's a lone wolf on that team, you know? And oftentimes they come from large organizations. They have a bunch of experience. Mm. They come in, people are excited. They can, they're guiding, giving new insights and things like that. Um, but oftentimes, you know, you might have one of these players that start to, you start to realize like it's more about them than it is about the team. Yeah. Right. It's more about their ideas. And this is uh, such a problem with large corporations. They kind of ruin you. Yeah. Right. They, t- they turn you into like a political animal. Yeah. Um, and I, I saw this very much like when I was at Amazon, it, it felt very meritocratic. The best ideas right. could win. You could get into a room and debate like with a VP 
or some EVP, uh, like you had better data and you had, you know, you could, you could get in there and it was disagree and commit. When I got to Microsoft and I ran large teams there, it felt very political. I had to make mm-hmm. sure people were in my corner and I had to get the consensus around all these different leaders mm-hmm. before I got into the room. And, and the meeting was just like to ratify something. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't right. a place where we we're going to, you know, go in and, and read the six pager and debate. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I can see that, you know, that's, a, that's an example of cultural uh, mismatch, right? If you come right. from a large, well-functioning organization like Microsoft, you, there's just a certain way of doing things there that may not be the, the, the team dynamic on a, on a startup. Right, right. And so for us to kind of the answer that, that question, high-performing venture-backed teams are highly collaborative. Mm. And, but they're not so collaborative that they, they only do what everybody agrees upon. And if not everybody agrees and they don't do anything, that's an error that a lot of venture-backed teams have. Yeah. So the role of the CEO or the role of any leader in the organization is to make sure that decisions are made. And, you know, if I have a leadership team that I'm working with and they're saying, you know, at the end of the year, we're going to hit $250 million. And then the head of sales saying, no, we're going to hit 150. And the CEO says, no, we're going to hit 300. For me, my role is to ask them why and get them on the same page about what, what is that dollar amount, right? Mm. Um, and let the, let questions happen, let conversation happen, but just try to dial in something that they all can agree on. Now, at the end of the day, if, if, the, if the head of sales is saying, no, it's going to be 250 and, the, and the, the CEO said, no, we need to hit 300, then they need to make that decision and say, no, we're going to hit 300 and help me figure out a way to hit 300. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or the CEO can say, you know, empower that, the head of sales to, to choose that 250. Um, and so I think what happens oftentimes in venture-backed companies is that dis- decisions aren't made. And they move on to the next topic. Mm. And even it's better to even, you know, make a decision and then maybe change that down the line when you have more information than to not make a decision because then people aren't going to be moving forward. So right. um, my belief and why we call ourselves collective genius as a company is that together, I really believe people can do more than they can alone. Yeah. But, at the, but you also have a hierarchy in these organizations. Um, and everybody needs to play that role and play their role. And that's, well, I'd, love to, I'd love to impa- unpack that for a sec, yeah. right? Because yeah. you can have really high functioning teams, like say in the military that have a very clear chain of command and mm-hmm. you know what the Colonel says, you know, that's what we're doing. We just go over that bunker. Decisions. We're yeah. That's how you make decisions. Right. And then, and then you have this other kind of more cooperative, collaborative, um, everybody gets heard and, but there's ultimately a decision. Can I talk about kind of the push and pull between hierarchy and team collaboration? Like what, what's the right mix? And right. Yeah, I'd love to unpack so, that. You know, in these environments, um, let's talk about OKRs. It's a good way to do this. Yeah, it's, OKRs, yeah. Yeah, and so in our OKRs. What are OKRs format, for the audience? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so OKRs are referred to as objectives and key results. The objective is what do we want to accomplish and the key results, how are we actually going to accomplish that? Measure What Matters talks about this yeah. quite a bit, right? Uh, it's a book called Measure What Matters. Um, right. You know, they'd say the objective is, you know, the, the big goal and then the key result measures you successfully achieving your objective, which is great. But one of the things that got lost a little bit, because these, these stem from management by objectives, you know, yeah. have you heard yeah. of those? MBOs were oh, by Drucker. Oh, yeah. That's GE, right? Yeah. Um, so Drucker had management by objectives. Right. And then this, this OKR model kind of took what was great about that, but wanted to really measure, which is important that we're actually getting these things done. But what it kind of lost in, in essence and what plagues a lot of venture back teams when they use OKRs is that they don't define what they actually need to do, <laughs> right? They define like hit $50 million. It's, it's, okay. it's the tactics that they, it falls down. It's the OGSTs of, of GE. Objectives, so you can say, yeah, you can yeah, say goals. it's the tactics, but a yeah. lot of these are like maybe project milestones or, you know, so if, let's say I need to hit 50 million by the end of the year, and that's my objective, and it's in my one-year plan, and I'm head to sales. Um, if my key results are all just measuring me getting to that $50 million, well, that's great, but it's missing us having the conversation in my team and as a leadership team, how we're actually going to do that. Yeah. And so on my team, it might be, I need to hire salespeople. I need to figure out the, the gates of the sell- selling process. I, I need marketing to help me with some more marketing tools. 
I, uh, I need to implement a CRM and I might need some help from that, my engineering department, even though they don't like to do IT stuff. But, you know, so th there's a lot of things I need to do and accomplish to hit that $50 million. Yeah. And so those would be really good key results versus just measuring every single quarter what's my revenue, right? Um, we need to do that too, but we lump that in the KPIs. So to go back, talking about collaboration and communication, using these, this OKR system, OKRs are great. We modified them to make them work really well for mm. venture back teams. And what we do when we, we uh, create OKRs at the leadership team level, we'll define an, uh, or objectives, we'll define what are the most important things that we want to accomplish by the end of the year. We'll do that as a leadership team and we'll look at each of the functional areas of the business. And let's say we're talking about sales, let's say it's $50 million. Um, before we even do that exercise, we typically do a call with the leadership team, tell them, give them prep work before we come into the OKR session or the, the vision session. And they work with their teams asking them the same questions. So mm. we really take a bottoms up approach before we come together as a team and make decisions. And so I think that's really important. Um, it's not a top down approach. This is what we're going to do. Let's do it. We really want to talk to the head of sales wants to talk to their team and say, Hey, what's success look like for us by the end of the year? Yeah. If you know, let's put it up on the board. Let's talk about what, what, what's that look like to us? If we, what are the top five things we want to hit by the end of the year? And if we hit these things as a sales team, we're happy. Yeah. They'll take that information from their team and they'll go into the leadership team session and they may have defined their one year plan with their top three to five objectives. Um, and then the team goes around and each functional area explains what their top three to five objectives are. And they'll have conversations and they'll iterate and change and they'll define their one-year plan. After that's over, they'll go back to their team and say, hey, after discussions, this is what we did. What do you think yeah. about this? Like this? Don't like this? And then we'd have an opportunity to come back one more time with, uh, from the team to discuss about what, what changes that they still might want to do. So it's an iterative process to get to your goals and it's an iterative process building OKRs, but it's definitely bottoms up and top yeah. down at the same time. Well, and, and, and I love this distinction and I, and I would love to uh, unpack it just a bit is the the tactics, right? Because, okay, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, we want to get uh, additional X dollars of revenue. Okay, great. That's mm -hmm. like a big objective uh, yep. or a key result, let's say. A grow is the objective. A key result is revenue. And then the sales team would take that. Uh, I'd love to have you unpack how you break that down into tactics for the sales team or, or, or do they? Yeah, so I would say there's two different tools here that we're talking about. One tool is the one-year plan. The one your plan is, is going to be objective based, right? So I typically do five objectives in each of the functional areas of the business. So you'd have five objectives that we want to get done by the end of the year in sales, yep. five in marketing, five in product, engineering, finance. And then we always do corporate and capital development, which is the role of the CEO in a venture back company. Their role is to build the organization and also make sure that they have the capital, right? And so what are the top five objectives within corporate and capital development, which is a small team. It's usually the CEO. Maybe it's backed by another founder or chief of staff or assistant, right? Yeah. Um, so we define those objectives in in a in an area what it's called the one-year plan, and we agree upon those. Then each quarter, we'll do OKRs at the leadership team level. So what are the top three to five objectives that we want to put under the microscope over the next 90 days? Bigger teams, we do 180 days. Yeah. Um, and then we define what those key results are and everybody on the leadership team owns those key results, even if it's someone on their team that's working on them. Right. Um, but we build it in layers, right? So there's going to be a layer of objectives and key results every 90 yep. or 180 days at the leadership team level. And then we do in each of the functional areas as well, they'll create their own layer of OKRs. We call, we call the cascading OKRs at Microsoft. So it's like one well, cascading's one... when they cascading ones they you choose three really important things and then there's key results that cascade all the way through the organization. Yeah. The um, okay, I think it does something different then. Yeah. I think yeah, it's like layers. Then, yeah. Like yeah, we describing. do yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I found with venture back teams from seed to late series stage, the layer approach works much better and it's much mm. cleaner. Yeah. Otherwise you have, you know, if you can think of a like a tree. Yeah, you know, you have this like you have one huge systems. thing, and it's yeah, you got an AE down here, like going, I, I don't know how to like affect that metric at all. You know, hundred yeah. percent, and that's one of the biggest errors <laughs> I find in OKRs is that, you know, maybe this quarter the uh, it's around product and it's around marketing and it's around some finance piece. What about sales and marketing? So like yeah. they can't really contribute to that. So does that mean that they just don't contribute to that? Well, right. yeah, but there's other things that need to get done. So. By doing a layer approach, what's yeah. most important for the leadership team, and you know they'll have their team work on some of that stuff. But then, if I'm the head of 
product? What's most important for my team one by the end of the year? And then what's mm -hmm. most important for my team in the next 30 days? And we will develop our own objectives as well and key results to make sure that we're still working our ways towards that one year plan. Yeah. Amazing. So I think it's really important that one year plan, the OKR is doing them in this format, uh, makes it really easy for teams. And it's not extra work. It's just, uh, you know, some people are like, well, it sounds like a lot of extra work. No, it's, it's just the way they work. Yeah. Right. So it's not extra work. It's, it's a really nice, clear, easy way to get things done. Um, and it kind of goes back to like what I said is like teams that are organized are the teams that win. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I know we have to wrap up soon, so I'm just going to do a kind of a modified rapid fire round. Um, let's just talk about any habits uh, from your book that we haven't talked about yet and kind of in a rapid fire kind of way. What, you know, if there's a founder out there listening, what are some of the, uh, the key takeaways uh, they need to know? Yeah, we hit a, a bunch of them. I mean, there it's I like people to read the book because they, <laughs> they uncover uh, yeah. fun and especially to the to the very end of the book. Uh, there's a bit of a Easter egg in it. Um, one's empowerment. So once the great thing about like defining what we're going to do, collaborating with the team, everybody gets on board. Sales knows what products do on product knows what marketing is doing. Then you have the ability to empower these teams to really just execute. And mm -hmm. so we haven't talked a lot about empowerment, but um, empowerment, once you are focused and know what you can do, you can yeah. just go crush it. And it, what it does for a CEO and what, what the problem that a lot of CEOs have is, is that they don't have the vis visibility of their organization. So now this gives them the map and the visibility of what everybody's doing. And there's a cadence that we do on a weekly basis to keep that visibility. Um, so it's, it's a myth. There's yeah. some books out there called Elevate and Delegate about, you know, just raise up and you're the visionary. But CEOs of venture-backed companies are the central piece to this organization. And they need to be talking to the board. They need to be talking to investors. They need to be talking to the market. They need to talk to their employees and partners. Yep. Um, and so they have to have this visibility to run the business. Yeah. They can't yep. just be a visionary in, in some room looking out the window. It's not ivory towerism. You need to actually get out of the building and, right. and actually walk through the cubicles, so to speak. Uh, and, and then that empowering, once everybody's clear on where they're going, what they need to do and why they do it, yeah. the mission, right? Now they're empowered to do that. And uh, they'll come across issues and roadblocks along the way. That's why the weekly meeting, we use this process called triage, solving problems. Because things are going to come up. You're, you're taking a path that no one's taken before. So yeah. you're going to have to be able to you know, tweak you know, and change directions. But you want to make sure you change directions as a team. I love that. that. Right? I love uh, at Amazon that that cultural principle is called ownership, right? Right. You disagree and commit in the meeting, right? That's the yep. collaboration, and and then you go like, now you own that, and you you do own it end to end. And, yeah. We, and they also call it single threaded ownership there, which I really loved because yeah. it's like one throat to choke. It's, right. You know, I remember uh, first week on the job, I'm in the room, huge project, the Stage Maker Marketplace that I launched, and Andy Jassy looks around the room, and goes, "Whose project is this?" And I'm, right. I'm a fifth day on the job in the room with Andy Jess. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. that's the ownership that they push down to you. It's like, okay, you own this. You own the success yeah. of this. It's not your boss or your boss's boss. And yep. Andy Jassy and I, is like, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's the right way to do it. And that's why we define roles and responsibilities once a year, at, at least at the leadership team level. And those, those leaders can do it with their teams as well. But then you're very clear, like what you own and what you do and what your roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. are. And then when we build the one-year plan, the head of sales owns sales. When they build the three-year vision, they own that three-year vision, right? I love that. Um, yeah. And they own OKRs. Every objective, every key result has an owner on each one of those and it has a date on each one of those, yeah. exactly. um, which creates accountability. Yeah. Well, Jeff, this was amazing. I could, could talk to you for another hour or two and maybe we'll have you back <laughs> on the podcast at some yeah. future date. Thanks for, so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. Likewise.